We are just beginning the second hour of night one of the Hidden Pivot slash Camouflage Trading course and uh, looking uh, at charts with the an eye toward finding ABC patterns. The visual trick that we're using is to identify the BC part of it first. In other words, to look at the big picture, whether it's an uptrend or a downtrend, and then try to discern uh, within that uptrend or downtrend, what the most visually distinctive move against it is, and that will be our B and C. Now, this last chart, um, you may see, you may realize that although I've labeled this pair, this bracket of uh, of high and low BC, that we there's an alternative BC that I could have used, uh, namely B down here, this low and see here that high. Let's see this on a bigger uh, scale. Um, and I've labeled that higher BC pairing B prime C prime. Notice that each of those, uh, each a, the A is the same in either case. But when I change BC, if I go to the lower BC, it gives me a lower target, a lower D. And B prime C prime, because they are both higher than that regular BC, it gives us a higher uh, D target that I've labeled D prime. Uh, also, notice, oh, let me go back to that. Also, notice that we got some pretty exact hits there when we came down to the D target that was predicted by A, B prime, C prime. When we got to the D prime target, it just went through it only very slightly and we got a bounce and and it took this thing a few hours to finally break through it. So in that respect, we have what I would call the hidden pivot effect. We've got a downtrend that definitely is feeling the support of our hidden pivot D. And when it broke below that D prime, the logical thing for us to infer was that it was going to the, the next lower D target. In other words, the D target associated with this lower BC. So here, again, when we break down below the first D prime, it's very logical for us to assume that next stop will be D, which it was almost precisely. Here is a pattern with two points A. And I did mention earlier that we never chisel these things in stone. Uh, there's uh, usually not a perfect A, B, and C. Sometimes A in particular will be will be uh, hard to pin down. There'll be some alternatives and it won't be clear at all where you should put your A. But uh, before you get frustrated with that task, uh, let me assure you that it happens to me as well. Sometimes I wish for a nice, good, clear pattern, but I don't get it. Here, what's clear enough is the BC piece of it. You know, we've got this uptrend going on and somewhere around here or here or here or here, we'd be getting curious about the question, how high can this thing go? Well, the answer to that question will always be, where's a good D hidden pivot target that we can depend on? So in this case, we don't have much of a problem with the BC part of this uptrend. Going from that high to that low uh, establishes, uh, and it looks like I've drawn the low in the wrong place, but it gives us a, a, an ABC pattern with authority. Um, we, get, we have another possible A right there. And just as I say that no point A is chiseled in stone, uh, looking at it from the opposite direction, each plausible A is going to produce at least something of a reaction on the DN. You know, you, you get a little bit of a pullback. The question is whether the pullback is going to be the big one or whether there are more important lows that we can use as A that will give us the ultimate D top here. All right, uh, here are a few things we haven't learned yet. Um, all of these A's, B's, and C's were, were highs and lows in different price patterns. But uh, I want to give you at least a, a rule or two to associate with highs and lows. I want you to know that some things that look like highs and lows are not real highs and lows, and that has implications for 
uh, what we do analytically, but also uh, how we work as traders. All right, another idea we've yet to learn, but this is a doozy, is the two peaks rule. The two peaks rule is intimately associated with the impulse leg rule. In fact, you can use those those terms interchangeably, but it's going to be the impulse leg dynamics that uh, you'll be most familiar with at the end of this lesson. All right, another idea yet to be covered is the use of what I call the one-off A. Uh, on the charts that we've looked at, most of the A's have been the obvious high or low on the chart, but you're going to see that uh, sometimes uh, our preference will be for not the obvious A, but for something close by that's just a little bit higher if we're talking about a bottom or lower if it's uh, an A used as an, a top. And uh, we're going to see how to use the P, the point P, the hidden pivot midpoint, uh, to get a lot of good tradable information. And finally, we'll take all of the things we've learned uh, to affect what I call camouflage trading. And again, let me repeat that once we get to camouflage, you're going to know uh, at least 90% of what you'll need to know to do camouflage trades. And there are just a couple little tricks that I put in a very secretive category of proprietary information. Uh, these are things that I do not divulge when I do hidden pivot demos. And I try not to talk about these couple little tricks uh, in the chat room as well. All right, here is a, a chart where I've sequentially numbered highs and lows. And your ability to find these numbered highs and lows will correspond directly to your ability to find A's, B's, and C's that give you uh, accurate targets and profitable entry points. The thing that I want you to notice about this chart as we consider high number one, low number two, high number three, is that each does not really become visually clear until you get something that occurs after it. So in other words, we really see this number two low. Uh, if you cut off everything to the right of it, it wouldn't look like you would know that that's anything. But once we get that high followed by that low, we can see that we see low number two simply because it is between two visually evident highs, number one and number three. And we see number three as a high because it eventually comes to be between uh, lows number four and two. And we don't really know about that number four low until we see it as being between highs five and three. And we don't really know that's a five until we see it as between four and six. So each time we see a higher low, um, it, it, there's always going to be some information lacking. We're uh, jumping ahead of ourselves a little bit, uh, but we're looking again, uh, as you must realize, at slides of stocks where the price action has already happened. And one of the difficulties of teaching the hidden pivot method is that, uh, at least with these PowerPoint slides, is that everything's already happened. It's unfolded. And for that reason, when you look at these PowerPoint slides, you don't have that speculative eye that kind of forces you to think about certain things. So when I suggest that uh, you uh, really come to the trade station sessions uh, with enthusiasm, it's because your learning curve is going to steepen so much. When You'll see that when, when we're looking at trade station uh, charts, where we don't know how everything uh, is going to play out, we learn a lot more quickly. And we're not forced to uh, suspend our, to, to put blinders on to pretend that something we see in these charts is not there. So it, it's really harder to look at these charts with patterns that have played out uh, than to uh, look at a chart where we don't know what's going to happen. And um, you're... I know that your your mind in that 
partly left brain, partly right brain, it, it feels to me like your mind is, is very well suited to uh, the, the way I'm teaching this method uh, on a basis of your question about, uh, you know, we use the little visual trick to find X, P, and D, but as you noticed, we were doing that in some instances where X and P had already played out. So I would say you're noticing some interesting things at this point, and uh, and so I'm uh, I'm putting you uh, really on the intermediate to expert slopes relatively quickly here in teaching some of these points. All right, another chart where we see uh, that I've labeled highs and lows that are all, in my visual way of looking at this big picture, they're all in the same league. You know, six and eight are in the same, on the same team here. Uh, they're genetically related. But you can see this little stuff in between. Uh, looking at the big picture, this little stuff here doesn't quite measure up to the highs and lows that we've labeled. Again, we're only able to find those highs and lows and label them when we look at the big picture. Uh, same deal, and uh, we see high, low, high, low, high, but we don't know to, to sort of rule all this stuff out as highs and lows until we've made the low and gone up to a perspective high there maybe started down a little bit. And uh, to repeat the, a point, these highs and lows will become your A's, B's, and C's. Uh, again, I've looked at the big picture and come up with highs and lows that I reckon are of similar degree. And you can see how this number five only sorts itself out only comes alive, visually speaking, suggests itself uh, when we get pretty long, far along the way toward number seven. It becomes officially a, a five high when we are officially potentially a five high at such point as uh, it is surpassed or around here. I did say earlier to look out for um, highs and lows that really weren't highs and lows and that's why I want to give you a rule to understand what a high or low is. A, a true high is defined as you have just seen by a low preceding it and a low following it. So in that respect we have a high up there but what I'm saying is that it isn't really. It's a high. It certainly looks like a good stick-up little peak right there. But And we do have a low that precedes it right there. But where is the low that follows it? And again, as we saw in those other charts, we only know that's a high because it sits between one low and another. But where is another? The fact is there isn't. So that's not a true peak. But if we were trading... If we were looking for a, a, a nice shortable high up here, we want to take a really good distinctive ABC pattern to give ourselves a reliable D target. And I already told you I'm in love with single bar impulse legs like this one, single bar A, single bar B. I would love to have a nice C there to give myself a good D target. So what I would typically do, even though technically our high labeled point X here is not a true peak, I would create one by, just by dropping down to perhaps the 10 minute chart or the five minute chart. That would create a few additional bars here and most likely a, a low that we could recognize as setting off this X peak there as it must be set off as a, as a true high. Actually, let's look at the other ones. Um, here, um, I'm not sure about this one myself. I, you can see the last one of those little bars there I've labeled a low. If it is, in fact, equal to the bar next to it, then it's what I call an atrocity low. It's ugly. It's atrocious. We, we like good, distinctive uh, stick-up highs like that one and that one and that one. But if we go, we've got a, a stick down low there. It's, it's, it's a single bar low. And we've got just by a hair a single bar high. 
but it doesn't look like we've got a bar, even if we measure down to a hundredth of a penny, it doesn't look like we've got a bar that sticks down all by itself. And that's all we need, really. We, we only need for it to stick down by a zillionth of an inch below all the others, and it becomes a, a true low. But here, based on the way I've drawn the chart, it's kind of hard to tell. Um, this is less difficult. You see that we've got a good stick up peak right there. It certainly looks like a distinctive high. And it does have a low that we can discern right there that precedes it. But there's really no low that follows it. Um, we can't really use this low does stick out a little bit, but it follows this peak right here, not that one that I've labeled X. Um, and the only thing that follows that X is a bar that's fused up right, right uh, fused up against it. So, so that's not a true high either. We would need to get down to the ten minute or the ten minute or the eight minute or the five minute chart to create for us a, a, a low right there that works. We'll see that in some other forms. Some charts express it a little more clearly. Um, all right. So here is. That very simple idea I promised I would uh, tell you about. And uh, everything you need to learn, you can learn in just a few minutes. But the impulse leg as a standalone tool, separate from the hidden pivot self, uh, method itself, is very powerful, very useful. Uh, it's, it's just, uh, as I say, it's, uh, it's worth the price of the course. All right. Uh, a few things you can do when you understand impulse legs. Uh, you can manage the risk of a trade with ease and confidence. I mentioned this earlier, uh, describing it as what I call an impulse leg based stop loss. Uh, you'll also be able to accurately identify dominant and minor trends. Uh, you're going to be able to separate fake out highs and lows from the real deal simply by paying attention to impulse legs. Uh, and corollary to that is you'll be able to gauge the strength of a trend just by looking at how impulse legs have either failed or succeeded uh, in getting past prior highs or lows. And finally, you put a few of these impulse leg ideas together and you're going to be at the point of doing camouflage trades. The two peaks rule says that in order for a trend leg to qualify as a true legitimate kosher impulse leg, the trend segment must surpass at least two previous highs in an uptrend or lows in a downtrend without correcting. So let's take a look. I've drawn a bunch of impulse legs here, each with a different colored arrow, each arrow having surpassed two prior lows in an uptrend, highs in a, uh, in a downtrend, highs in an uptrend. All right, so the first impulse leg we see here is goes from that nice sharp high to a single bar low, and it got past one low here, and we don't count that low as having been surpassed because it's in the shadow of this down stick here. But this low is slightly lower than that one. Number two is just a tick or two below number one, so we count that as a separate low having been surpassed by this impulse leg from there to there. So in getting from there to there, it met our requirements for impulse leg because it did surpass two prior lows, this one here and that one there. And it may have actually gotten past that one too, but that's not a true, we're looking at impulse legs of the same degree, or, or I'm sorry, prior lows of the same degree. So if we are doing our little high, low, high, low, high, low trick, we would go low, high, low, high, low, high, and you can see we'd be skipping this little, little curly Q right in here from that high to that low. We need a true high to be above that one. So again, low, high, low, high, low, high, low, high. All right, so, so this impulse leg met the minimum requirement, got past one, in, one uh, low and a second there. Uh, a further point that I want to make here is that we distinguish highs and lows in one way as to being internal or external. 
And very simply, that means that this low is an internal because it's internal to a downtrend that we're measuring that includes our impulse leg. This low, on the other hand, is what I call an external. It was made as part of a rally. Again, we're measuring a downtrending impulse leg so that prior lows that it gets past that are part of the down, downtrend itself are internal and that's an external. And in my intuitive scheme of things, I tend to regard a, a, a trend leg that surpasses an external as a little stronger than just getting past an internal. In other words, this low offers a little bit more support than that one. And you can imagine that because this support is made on the way down and this support was supportive of a rally. It's a consolidation support. So again, uh, and, and all right, to get finally to the actual rule, and I try to give you as few rules as possible, uh, a true impulse leg has to get past at least one internal and one external to qualify as an impulse leg. All right, so let's see that work out a couple more times here. Good sharp impulse legs, good stick up, nice distinctive point A, and also a good distinctive point B. It got past one internal low, internal because we're measuring this downtrending leg that's part of a downtrend that actually began here. This is the highest high we see on the chart. It's not very distinctive, but it is still a little bit higher than that high. So in, in the downtrend that we see in the chart, it really began from here, goes all the way to there. So that little peak separates rising from falling. And so this low and this low were made as part of the decline. So this counts as an internal low. And uh, again, this low here was made as part of an uptrend. So it's an external. Uh, the important thing here is that our impulse leg is properly and legitimately impulsive because it got past the required one internal and one external. Um, we don't count this low or that one is having been surpassed by this impulse leg because this one and this one are in the shadow of this stalk right here. They're, they're occluded by it. They're, they're covered, this low and that low, by this one right here. So, all right, if it had gone just a little further and gotten through that true external, though, right there, then we would have, which it did actually, you can see, we went all the way from there to there. It got past the minimum requirement, one internal and one external, but we see it also got past another external. So more than meeting just the, the minimum requirements of one internal and one external, it got through an extra external, and that speaks to any strength we might infer from the next leg down, from the CD leg down. And I apologize for the fact that, that I'm illustrating with uh, a downtrending pattern that didn't work out the way it should have. Here we've got this nice impulsive AB uh, impulse leg. And instead of rallying and then dropping like a stone, it rallied all the way up to here. It looks like it's pretty even with AB, so it's not even a downtrend that you could measure as A, B, C, D. It, it isn't a true a downtrend that you can measure. All right, next impulse we see is uptrending, and it's not from this low here. We want to take the shortest piece of impulse leg we can find, actually trade, analyze, measure, and predict. So we take a stick down low. It's kind of hard to see, but it's right here uh, where the gold arrow starts, and it goes up to a single distinctive single bar point B peak, and it got past the required internal high, internal because it was made, this peak was made as part of an uptrend begun here. And it got past this true external right there, external because it's a little peak made on the way down. And you can see if we're doing our high, low, high thing here, we've got a high, a low right there, and a high right there, and the next low is down there. And I don't really... Uh, uh, an external is an external, and by that measure, 
this external here is as important as this one here. The only thing, the, the, the thing that makes them equal in their significance is that they're both legitimate in the same way. This is a peak that is sandwiched between a good, you know, between a, a true low and another true low there. So in terms of their, they are equal, even though this low looks a little more distinctive than this kind of hidden away low. All right, our next impulse leg, and, and again, this is one of those weird things where we've got a good impulse leg, a nice rally from that low to that high, gets past the required internal and external, and instead of pulling back like it should have after making such a nice impulse leg and then going for a rally, it hit that high and sank like a stone. We didn't even have a chance to get long. To, we didn't even get a little ABC pattern there to work to get long. It just, it, it rallied above internal and external peaks and then just collapsed. Next impulse leg here, and I could have used that as an A, but notice that if I'm calling that a good distinctive A low, we've got a, a nice high to follow it, but where is the high that precedes it? There is none. So I start with, uh, with this low right here, and uh, I measure the impulse leg, A, B, got past Believe it or not, we can count that as an internal low. It's small, but it's real. That's an external, and that's a second external. So this impulse leg more than met the minimum requirement. And again, in this example that I took, that's all, <laughs> it's all paradoxes. Uh, we got this powerful impulse leg, and instead of pulling back and giving us the expected powerful CD follow through, uh, it, it just collapsed without even letting us in on a trade, without even triggering us in on a trade. And let me qualify that word power, powerful impulse leg. When you use that term, when you say this is a powerful impulse leg, that essentially implies that it's going to give way to a CD leg that reaches its D target or, or, or better even. So so that is a an objective way of reckoning uh, the nature of a powerful impulse leg. A powerful impulse leg simply implies that eventually it's going to give you a CD follow through that reaches its D target. Um, other impulse legs, uh, this is a one off. We, we haven't talked about that yet, but I didn't use the obvious high. I used the one off ski right there. It got past a teeny tiny internal. And whenever you use a one-off A, it implies you're going to have an internal high or low next to it. And it got past one external. So it's met the minimum requirement here. But before this thing turned around, before it took an upward correction, it got past yet another external right there. So it's a more than minimally powerful impulse leg. And what that gives us to expect is a CD follow-through leg that gets to its D target. Uh, just before we leave this, let me do our high-low, just so you get the visual sense of this pattern. Uh, low, high, low, high, low, high, low, high, and so on. So, this one didn't count. I guess that's what we got out of that. Um, here is uh, another impulse leg. Good sharp single bar A rallies to a single bar B. No corrective anything in, the, in in between. And we see in getting from A to B, nice impulse leg, it exceeded one internal peak right there. Uh, we'll skip this. This is sort of an in-between, but this is a major high and a good legit external. And a second one right there. Now, I'm going to stop just for a moment here and ask you uh, to think about that number three external. Is that the real deal? I mean, does it look like anything? It doesn't. I call that a look to the lefter, and you'll see in a moment why. But you, you can see if we really get uh, inspect this closely, you see that there is a bar that sticks out in just the tiniest way right there. And it is set off by a low that preceded it there and another low that follows it here or here. So it's, it's a good legitimate uh, external peak in the rules-based sense that we've come to learn uh, to define highs and lows. This this has as much going for it as any peak we're going to find. It's it's a totally legitimate uh, a peak. 
but it's not really obvious, and and it's not exactly a breakout point for most other chartists and traders. They might see a little bit of resistance there, but whereas they see just a little bit of resistance, uh, we see something far more interesting. We see an impulse lag that has gotten past not just the required internal and external, but it's notched an extra external before it took a breather. And I call that a look to the lefter. Uh, I like to ascribe demonic or beast-like characteristics to these trading vehicles because they really are beasts. They're not moving of their own volition. They are moving because there are a bunch of maniacs trading them, and each one of them has his own idea about what the next guy is going to do next. So in that game of second, third, fourth, and fifth guessing everybody else in the game, uh, this thing goes through incredible movements just to e evade easy profits. Um, so, um, you know, it's it's a rule of thumb. It's an axiom that everybody's not going to be making money all the time. So if they're all looking at a chart and trying to guess, outguess each other as to what it's going to do next, you can imagine how freakish the price movement gets because it can only be in one place at one time. But that doesn't diminish the fact that it's being acted on uh, by hundreds or even thousands of, of competing brains. So that's why these things move around so crazily. And so, so when it comes up to here, I refer to that high right there as a look to the lefter because this little monster is rallying and it looks to the left and it sees just this little tiny resistance peak there. And it says, okay, you little SOB, I'm going to come after you too. And I like that. I, a rally shows gumption and guts. When it gets up to some resistance, even though it may not look like much, it is a resistance. And it looks at it and says, screw you, I'm going to take you out before I take a rest. So again, we've got this rally. And this creature looks to the left and says, I'm going to get you too before I take a little breather. So again, the look to the lefter peak or low in a downtrend implies a legitimate high that's pretty obscure, but not in the least insignificant for purposes of our counting how many prior highs an impulse leg has gotten past for purposes of determining how strong that impulse leg is. An impulse leg that gets past just that extra added external right there is at least somewhat more powerful than the impulse leg that's fulfilled merely the minimum requirement of getting past one internal and one external. All right, let me go to where we have a little more clarity. Here, obvious in, uh, impulse leg, it got past, it, it's, it's better than the minimum requirement because it got past not just internal and external, it got past two externals. And that's a little bit harder than getting past, a little more impressive than getting past an internal and an external is getting past two externals. Um, we've got that Lindsay problem here of an impulse leg that's so strong, that's so attractive, that everybody wants to get in when, when the what looks to be a follow-through leg uh, gets off the launching pad somewhere around here. And you can see how it handled them. It came down to here just a ticker to below what we initially used as a point C low to stop them all out. And then, of course, it was off to the races. Um, here is on the lower left-hand uh, quadrant a, a chart that illustrates that similarity between uh, hidden pivot dynamics and uh, Elliott wave theory. We've got a point B that got past an AB impulse leg that got past one internal and by a single tick, it got past this external as well. And that makes all the difference to us and to the Elliott Wave guys, because everything here, we've now got an impulse leg. It's, it's, this rally is not corrective relative to that peak. It's impulsive. It's broken out above it. It's a new, new trend leg in effect. And just as the Elliott Wave guys see that impulse leg, even if it gets a zillionth of an inch above that one, we're the same way. We see a usable, tradable impulse leg. It's got everything we want. And by the time it pulls back to here, 
most of the village idiots that we trade against are going to be reading that simply as a double top, nothing special. But not only is it not a double top and something special in our book, it's something very tradable because in the course of creating that, in the process of creating that impulse lag, we've got a beautiful but very subtle A, B, C that you need only have been entered right there to start your way on a road to profit. Um, let's see. Here is um, here is uh, an A B impulse leg, and I want you to notice that between A and B. This thing had quite a wild ride. It's not like it's a straight line. I've drawn it as a straight line. And in a mechanical way uh, of doing hidden pivot trades and analysis, we treat it as a straight line. We treat all the zigzagging as though it never occurred. Uh, how can we do that? Well, the rational objective explanation is that all of this zigzagging occurred before what we came to call an impulse leg even surpassed a single external. So all the zigzagging is off our radar. We don't even see it. We ignore it because it all happened before this thing got past any prior lows. When it finally does, it goes a little bit further and gets past a second external right there. So we love this. We love buying D down here because this is a very gnarly ABCD pattern. Um, and... Uh, I'm going to explain a little bit down the road. We see that this is a 481 low versus a 485 low. It This low only surpassed that one by four cents, but that makes all the difference to us. It means that we're not looking at what I call a sausage trade, a term that I'm going to explain in the fullness of time. Um, we gauge the strength of an impulse leg by counting the number of prior peaks it has exceeded without a pullback. Now we've just touched on this a little bit, but let's see it in some of its specific details here. Uh, this slide, you, you already know about the idea that is uh, expressed here. Uh, let's take a look at it in the real world. Here we've got a chart of Newmont Mining, and I just sort of stepped into a place where I saw a promising impulse leg in retrospect. Uh, it's right here. We've got a good single bar, a good stick down A, and just by a hair, we've got that's a single bar B. It sticks up a little bit above that bar right there. So it is distinctively, discreetly alone. It qualifies as a single bar. And you see that in the process of getting from A to B, it got past one internal. Um, and I, call, I, I, I did not include this one because if we were doing our low, high, low, high trick, we would go low high, low, high, the big picture. This is sort of an intermediate peak. So this is a true internal. It's not nothing that this thing got past. That's that's going to be at least some resistance, but we'll, we'll call this the true internal here. It's not a big deal that you need to worry about as far as making that distinction yourself. All right, we don't count this as anything having been surpassed because that peak lies in the shadow of, of this this uh, stalk right here. Uh, but this doesn't. This is a, uh, an external peak all unto itself. And it is a little higher than this internal. So it is a peak that was surpassed separately by this impulse leg. It got past one internal then and one external. So that qualifies it as an impulse leg. It's exactly what we need, what we're looking for. And by the time it pulls back to here and starts to rally, you've got a good buying signal at X. Uh, this anticipates camouflage just a little bit. I'll mention it right here uh, because you're already aware that there's a problem with Lindsay. You know, when we get an obvious AB impulse leg and a point C, everybody wants to get in right there. And the only thing that can happen from that point forward is it sinks to stop them all out and then starts up again. Why didn't that happen here? Because the AB impulse leg is not quite special enough. It's not distinctive enough. It doesn't look quite strong enough 
uh, to be anything special. And some people are going to read it as having double top with resistance over here. Some are going to say, well, this rally doesn't mean anything until it gets past Mr. Big right here. So it's just, it's not a very impressive rally, but it has everything we need uh, to, to make it tradable, namely an AB impulse leg that got past the required internal and external. But the strength of it is somewhat camouflaged because it just seems to die in the middle of nowhere. Uh, you know, for a rally up to here and then pulled back, I think it would get given us an entry point that would have that would not have worked. Uh, we talked, uh, you saw on that one slide, that uh, if you look at these impulse legs in terms of the number of prior highs and lows they exceeded, it gives you a, a strength, a hierarchy of strength of the impulse leg itself. And here, you can see that we've got an unbroken AB impulse leg. There are no BC corrections along the entire path of A to B. And in that single unbroken downtrend, downtrending leg, we took out one internal there. We took out an external there, a second, and even a third. So, so this is uh, an impulse leg whose strength is really masked. Uh, we see it as really powerful, in other words, very likely to achieve a D target at some point. We see it as very powerful because it, without any breathe, w uh, corrections, without any upward uh, corrections, it got past not merely the required internal and external lows, but yet a second external and a third external low. So, so it's a very powerful leg, and it gives us a, a reason to short more aggressively at point X. Um, there's some times we'll be looking at a chart, and I want you to appreciate that uh, that very powerful and promising impulse legs can result from relatively short, stubby little uh, rallies or, or declines if we're headed down. In this case, we're here on a on a given day, and I've drawn this dotted arrow to show what might ha what would have to happen the next day to create a really m very powerful impulse leg and you can see that in just the short uh, hypothetical rally that i've drawn with that dotted line it would have surpassed one internal peak one external and a second external right there so we would love uh, especially if we're camouflage trading we would love for a rally that gets up to three to the number three peak or maybe one or two ticks above it and pulls back because and pulls back just a little bit because as you can visually imagine a rally that does that that gets right up to about P and starts pulling back that will look like nothing special to most traders but of course we see it as a very special very powerful but in a concealed way impulse leg that got past one to the required minimum but also a second external right there so uh, and and this would be a bet the ranch trade where you've got uh, a good strong but well concealed impulse leg and a shallow pullback uh, after making a point B high that to most traders will not appear to have broken out above that one or not by enough that they even care about it. All right, this is an idealized uh, rendering of some of these of the hierarchy of strength. Uh, that we reckon in various impulse legs. The two on the left side, uh, upper and lower, represent uh, really good strong impulse legs. You can see that in the first one, the top here, we went from A to B and it got past not only the required internal and external, but a second external. Here, uh, the, we have an AB impulse leg that did a bit better than getting past an internal and an external peak. It got past two externals, one, two, before pulling back. And here is uh, the minimum requirement impulse leg. I call it weak, but it's still usable for purposes of, uh, of getting a long entry point. All right, so we see that it got past the required internal and external, but no more than that. And finally, we've got, uh, this is pretty good uh, uh, submerged uh, concealed strength because we've gone from uh, A to B 
got past one internal, one external, uh, another external that I failed to, to consider. It's a, because it's slightly higher than this one here, it is a separate external that we should consider as having been exceeded by the impulse leg. So the impulse leg again got past the required minimum, internal and external, but also a second external and a look to the left external right there. Look to the left once again being a teeny tiny thing that most other traders and chartists are not considering, but which we see as a fully fledged external and one to be counted therefore uh, in our reckoning of the strength of the impulse leg itself. All right, here is a, um, um, let's see here. Uh, we've got a nice uh, anthropomorphic example here where uh, I've uh, expressed, we've got a nice rally here. Nice, but look what it did. It got all the way up to this look to the left resistance. It saw it and it chickened out. It didn't get past it. It, 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 could, it would have taken just two more ticks, 20 cents to get past that, that peak right there and it chickened out. And from that point, it, this rally officially failed to get past that high at such time as we get a downtrending impulse lag. In other words, it gets up here and when it drops off just a little bit, we can't know for sure that it's chickened out. But when it starts making impulse legs to the downside after having uh, chickened out up there, then we know it's a real yellow bellied chicken. And it gives us the chicken heartedness of that rally gives us reason to think that the downtrend is going to come roaring in right here. And for that reason, we want to pay particular attention to a downtrending ABC that we can use as a tradable A, B, C. And to kind of summarize here, the failure of that C uh, to get above that look to the left or right there was telegraphing the eventual collapse, the, the completion of this downtrend to its D target. Even so, we could have tried bottom fishing at the P midpoint. Um, all right. I, this is something I've mentioned, but I want to make it explicit in, in a rules-based way. It's a rule that you're not going to be caring about looking at or calculating most of the time. Uh, but I want you to know about it right away and to at least have it in the back of your mind. When I talk about an impulse leg, an AB leg, as occurring without any correction, without drawing a breath, without having a BC pullback. I mean a pullback, a correction, a breath, a pause in the rules-based sense that we talked about in the beginning of this course, namely a BC pullback that gets into the window. So let's see that here. Um, we have... Uh, Uh, we have an impulse leg, A to B, and you can see that it got past one external and a second external. Uh, it would have been signaling considerable more power on the CD leg if we had gone all the way up to uh, here, taking out the number three peak without a, a breath, without a pullback. In this case, we don't even have to measure it to know that the impulsive rally was broken up, there was a pause, there was a correction, it drew a breath right here. We only needed for the pullback to be equal to 0 0.618 of this KA segment, but you can eyeball it and see that the BC correction is almost equal to, or maybe even slightly larger than the KA segment. All right, so, so here um, we've got an impulse leg and a D target, uh, somewhere up there, um, but we want to trade a, a smaller segment. We want to look at, uh, well, you, we'll get to that with camouflage, but the place we want to trade, we, we want to get in. We can get in at X off the big pattern there, but we've got another X coming up on a smaller pattern here with a commensurately smaller stop loss. That's a bit off the point, but let me take you back to the same chart, but with a, a bit of a modification. 
Right here, we see that I've called everything from that low A to that high B an unbroken impulse lag. But look at all the zigzagging that occurred on the way up. How can I say that it made it all the way from A to B without a pause, a correction? And, and we see, though, this zigzagging doesn't even matter because, as we saw in that other chart, it occurred before we even got past any prior externals. So we see the chop here. And yes, we had enough of a pullback from that high to that low to get into the window to equal 0.618 of that. But there's no impulse leg here. It didn't get past anything, much less one internal and one, internal, one external peak. It did by the time we reached there. It got past one external and a second and even a third there. But are we allowing ourselves to call everything from that low to that high an unbroken, unpaused, uncorrected, uh, without a breath impulse leg? Well, we already know why this, we don't even look at this stuff here. But what about here? We do have a pullback. And here, you might want to measure it. But I think you can eyeball it and see that the pullback from that high to that low is not quite equal to 0.618 of this KA segment. So we don't even count it. We, we, we see it's a zigzag, but it doesn't even show up on our, our calculator radar. And so, indeed, everything that occurred from there to there is an unbroken impulse leg. Um, here is uh, a point B uh, uh, ending for an impulse leg. And you notice that although it didn't get past Mr. Big, the marquee high right there, it did get past a, a peak that we would be looking at. We would be saying, what a nice little look to the lefter. Other traders, most of them, I dare say, would not be looking at a high that just gets above that little peak there as being a breakout high. It's nothing special. But it is something special to us because in getting past that look to the lefter right there, we get this rally here to qualify itself as a true legitimate impulse leg. Uh, here, uh, Suresh, I hope that you're you're thinking what you were thinking um, earlier today in the chat room. Uh, your question might be, Rick, you know, look, um, we've got a pullback from there to there that did get in the window. We've got such a mini tiny KA segment that you didn't need much of a pullback at all from there to there to get us in the window. So how can you call everything from there to there an impulse leg when it got broken up here and maybe even here? Well, the answer goes to that very important point that I made earlier that sometimes we want to just say, screw that, you know, look at the big picture. By the time we're, we're over here, we're looking at, we're looking at low, high, low, and we're pretty much ignoring this stuff here. Uh, when, we, when we ignore it, we're basically saying, yeah, I know that this is technically a KA segment and even this, but in the big picture, when we look at everything taken together, this really becomes the KA. We see it as such only taking in the big sweep and recognizing that the, the A's, B's, and C's are here, here, and here. So, um, so again, this is a case where looking at the big picture uh, trumps the rules. Uh, the, the, and such niggling concerns is, as Rick, this is really technically a BC break in what you're calling an unbroken A, B impulse leg. And we, we know, or we could probably guess, that if we moved up to the 30-minute chart, in other words, zooming out rather than in, that we could scrunch these, we could get rid of a few of these bars, and it would display more clearly as an A, B impulse leg that is, in fact, unbroken. We'd eliminate a lot of this little, um, little stuff in here. A good uh, bull trend tends to get past at least one external with each new thrust. And you can see we've got a good thrust here. We've got impulsiveness starting down here, but we've got a good thrust here. And like a good impulse leg, it got past internal and external. 
uh, forget about the fact that it didn't bear fruit. It, it needed to correct a bit more before we embarked on this next big leg up. But uh, as you see, with each bullish trend leg from here to here, from here to here, each one, the point B high, just gets past something uh, in the way of a peak to, to the left of it. And so a good, if we look at the big bull trend here, we take that as an A right there, and that is a B up there, and that is a C. Um, if we look at that big trend, we should want to see in smaller instances of impulse legs, we should want to see with each new thrust a true impulse leg, a leg that gets past at least one internal and one external. So, so good bull trends like this big one here that covers the whole page uh, are, are manifest, they're discernible, they are confirmed in the ability of smaller rally legs to be truly and legitimately impulsive. Um, this chart was drawn before I, uh, before camouflage trading was even a glimmer in my eye, but I want to show you what your, what paying attention to subtleties, subtleties that meet our rules, can do. Because this is another bet the farm trade, uh, one that you couldn't couldn't lose on. All right, look at first of all what I've called an impulse leg. Uh, this nice single bar low, and it rallies to a good distinctive stick up high. Now, you can see that it got past the internal peak number one here at 519.50. But if we slide all the way to the left, we see a look to the lefter just a tick higher than that number one peak. And because it's a tick higher, it's not in the shadow of the number one peak, it counts as the external peak that our impulse leg needs to exceed to qualify as a legitimate impulse leg. So this is so well disguised. This is such beautiful camouflage because from our perspective, it is a picture perfect, absolutely gorgeous impulse leg. Single bar A, single bar B, single bar C, got past one internal, got past one external. What are you waiting for? Just buy the X right there and, and ride them cowboy. Uh, you're, you're in beautifully right there. And again, it's because what looked like a kind of nondescript rally to nowhere, a lot of chop, defined itself in our rules-based way of looking at things as just a great little impulse leg. And incidentally, I have given away uh, one of the very few proprietary secrets uh, with regard to camouflage trades. And that is that when we do camouflage trades, essentially, of finding small ABC patterns within larger ones, um, we require that at least two of the coordinates, A and C, or B and C, be fashioned from good, distinctive, sharply drawn uh, single bars. So we've got that going on here. And I will explain why uh, a bit further down the road here. All right. One other consideration is what I call a peak along the wall. It's, it's just in, in the way we've looked at it so far, it's simply an external peak, maybe even a look to the left, or although it's starting to become distinctive enough that other traders, the, I refer to them as the riffraff or the hoi polloi, would sense a breakout themselves if it went above that. So, uh, so we don't have that exclusively as our breakout point. Other traders will be aware of that. So strictly speaking, it's not quite a look to the lefter because it's not quite that subtle that others won't be using it. Just the same, it counts in the way that we've discussed earlier and that in the way that any rally that gets past it is passing a true external peak. And if you've got a rally like the one that I've drawn here hypothetically in a dotted line that gets past, uh, let's see, that's a an external peak right there, number one, and a second external and a third, uh, it's a pretty powerful impulse leg. Now, if I were short some big picture trade, I was short from way over here, and I wanted to stay short without getting uh, shaken out of it with the false signal, the 
the impulse leg, I would use an impulse leg based stop. And the one that separates the man from the boys here, uh, a rally that gets past this external and that external might threaten my short position. But in order for me to assume this thing is really turning around in a big way, I need for it not to get past merely these standard issue externals, but at least one external along the peak of some steep wall such as this one. So uh, I'm going to go into that just a little bit further, but since we're at the end of our second hour, let me pause. The